<laughs> Welcome back to Market on Close. I'm Oliver Rennick. We are going to be joined now by Bob Iaccino. He was here with us yesterday talking energy, founder, chief strategist at Path Trading Partners. Bob, let's start off there because yesterday I asked if you should go out and buy uh, rails based on uh, whether or not they're going to fill that gap that's needed. We were just talking with George Tillis. Even though a little upside in one of the suppliers, Stiefel basically came out and said, look, rails are not going to be the solution to the midstream problem right now. Uh, then we see right. a rigs number that was below for the U.S. Are things starting to make sense here? They are, Oliver. This is exactly what we talked about yesterday. It's sort of the last conversation we had about crude. They can't pull more crude out of the ground if there's nowhere to put it. The solution to this is more pipelines and you've got EPA restrictions, both in the US and Canada, uh, different administrations, different uh, organizations, should I say, with their different environmental protection agencies, both have to get approval for Canada to come down to the Gulf Coast or to their own ports, which are seasonal ports. And then for everything that's going on in the US production, pipelines is the only short term answer. And that short term is still 18, 24 months uh, to build let alone get approval. Now there are some pipelines with approval. President Trump has boasted that he's tried to streamline that process. Maybe he has, maybe he hasn't. We don't really get a look behind that curtain, but we'll see, that's the solution there. So why add rigs if you can, are gonna pump it and store it on site? That's oversimplification, but that's really what's going to happen if you increase the rigs. Now, uh, what's I think fascinating here, Bob, is uh, sort of uh, once again, as we've talked about the energy play, I mean, is there an opportunity through the stock market to, you know, kind of get exposure to these companies that potentially will fill that gap? Or is it unclear who's going to sort of based on some of those pricing and regional issues, right? Whether it's trucks versus rails or if it's uh, the exposure to MLPs, but then you mentioned the pipeline issues. So it becomes a pretty complex trade. Yeah, it does. I think if your only option is to do it through equities, which I mean, I'm I'm at the CME group, that's not where I would play it. But if your option is to do it through stocks, you've got to stay in some of the major refiners more than anything mm. because they are just operating full out. I mean, it, you know, they're, they're, we talked about this yesterday. Mm -hmm. RU went up again. Refinery utilization went up again. Stockpiles continue to drop in the crude oil space because the refineries are pulling it out and the crude can't get there. Again, that raises prices. Now, it's going to hurt the crack spread a little bit, but gas prices will go up. But if you look at sort of the inventory figures, just the outright figures, last year at this time, 509 million barrels in inventory. Go back and see what's happened over the last, say, four weeks. 436 million barrels down to 432, down to 426, down to 416. That's U.S. storage. You continue to see these numbers drop because the refineries are pumping it out at the higher gas prices, higher jet fuel prices. Mm. So that's probably the best place to play it. There's also uh, stock symbol NOV. Uh, Saudi Aramco just announced a deal with them. They are up about a half a percent today. I'm sure you might have talked about that. Um, I can't remember the full name of the company, but stock symbol NLV. That might be one that plays out over time because they're doing a refinery joint venture with hmm. Saudi Aramco, so that could be pretty beneficiary, uh, beneficial there. All right, uh, Bob, let's switch gears. I want to talk to you about the U.S. dollar now, obviously related to the commodity space, but uh, the re mm -hmm. uh, you know this dollar strength that we have been tracking, uh, I've largely pinned on our, our economic data just cruising away relative to the rest of the world. That's starting to change the past week or so. That story is breaking down. It's not that uh, our surprises are totally negative, because they're not, but they're getting less positive, and the Eurozone has kind of flattened a bit. Our economic dominance, as we see here in the Economic Surprise Index chart, is, is lessening a bit, Bob. What does this mean for the greenback? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it does two things. Number one, it shines a big light, a big spotlight on globalization. If you're going to get a slower global economy, you're going to get a slower US. We got PCE, both year over year core and headline, year over year, right? The Fed's favorite me measure of inflation come in slightly higher, but the month over months were smaller. The consumer spending numbers were smaller. Does this give the Fed the impetus to continue to flatten this yield curve. It certainly doesn't cause fear of inflation at those levels, 2.3% on the headline, 2% on the core. Certainly nobody is looking out over a perspective of the first 34 billion in tariffs on China, in addition to steel and aluminum, supposed to go into effect next week, Friday, a week from today. You don't look over that horizon and say, inflation is going to run, long-term treasuries are going to rally, yield curve's going to steepen and the dollar's gonna strengthen. You see the opposite. 
So there's got to be some new catalyst to the dollar. I think it shines a spotlight, a magnifying glass, whatever old stupid cliche I want to use on globalization and how it still affects the dollar, even if you're America first. Hmm. Uh, I don't know. I'll throw a microscope into the mix. All right, last point is we've got uh, Trump Yonker meeting coming up, and maybe it'll give some degree of uh, resolution and. Uh, it, after this pretty solid little inflation number from the Eurozone, maybe they're feeling uh, better. Do you expect resolution on this anytime, Bob? Are you trying to play a resolution from a trading perspective? Sort of. Um, I, I am still bullish equities. Um, I've slowly gotten out of the Russell and started to look at some of the other indices. You know, the meeting with Juncker, I think, is a big deal because if we know anything, we know that the global leaders are starting to understand how to play Donald Trump. That's where I'll give Justin Trudeau uh, the opposite of props, whatever that would be. If you stroke him in public and in private, all of a sudden he comes out with an announcement that we're going to work this out, we're talking, and your markets recover. Um, I think Juncker will do that. I think he's a very, very smart guy. So I think you could see one of these Twitter resolutions to the problems between the U.S. and EU. And to that notion, I would say Xi Jinping should have a meeting for the fifth. Yeah. Um, he should come over, go to Mar-a-Lago, hang out, drink some rice wine and talk about things. And the next day, Trump will tweet out that everything's going to be OK and everything will recover and these things will get dialed back. That's how I would play it. I think that's how Juncker's going to play it. All right, uh, Bob Icino, great to get your take on this Friday. Have a good warm weekend here in Chicago, Bob. Look forward to catching up you with you. as well, my friend. Next week. Thank you, sir. Bob Icino is a founder and chief strategist at Path Trading Partners.